Okay, more education books. Um, this is just kind of random stuff, but also uh, disability stuff, and then more random or yeah, so ed psych, ed psych stuff and developmental stuff, and there's a literacy book there. So just kind of sort of random. Um, so here's the limits and possibilities of schooling. It's actually not a bad book, even though it's. I don't. I often disagree with sociology that it just seems like it's so irrelevant often, and so subject to change, because it's dependent on the individuals. It 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 blurs their eyes on the individuals in society and just looks at society. But society is are acting individuals, so it's so it just seems to me like it's it's so um, susceptible to change. If you study a society in 2012. That society, it's going to change in 2013. And is your research going to be very useful? <sighs> so, but it's not, it, I, I have read many, much of this for a paper I was writing, and it's, it's all right. That one's by Hearn, H-U-R-N. Here's um, Schools and Students by Gills. Just a book that was being discarded at the library, and I picked it up. Haven't read that though. Haven't looked at it. Here's a here's a um, popular book in recent education ideology. I want to say, Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Frere. Frere was a uh, Brazilian educator. He began. Um, he was um, he taught literacy to farmers. Um, and he helped a lot of people with um, gain literacy in order to participate in politics and vote and things like that and be more, um, I don't want to say, not educated, but they're more aware of the, what their governments are doing and, and all of that. And, and then he entered the government and he became, I think it was Secretary of State in Brazil or something like that. And then he became well more well known, visited the United States and lectured, I don't know if it was at Harvard or somewhere else, but after he wrote this book, and so this is certainly um, socialist, absolutely, Frere even dresses, if you've ever seen some of the pictures of him, he dresses like the Chinese dictators do, with the plain shirts that are like buttoned up right at the neck, and, and he dresses like a, a Cuban dictator, um, so he was absolutely communist, or socialist, or some some brand of that, and he's taught in schools because of the, again like the anti-European, anti-West kind of ideology that's pervasive in ed research and ed teaching and teachers' colleges. Um, so, in my masters, not my not in teachers ed. I did my teachers ed actually in the United States. I'm a Canadian. I did my teachers ed actually in the United States, and it was just common sense really. Uh, there really wasn't any, yeah, it was just pretty much common sense stuff. But I did my master's in Canada. Uh, my master's in ed was a lot of this kind of stuff. And so, yes, for a course I took, um, we did have to read Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And so we learned about anti, we learned about the evil Europeans and the imperialism and, and, um, all that stuff. So certainly, anti Plato's Academy. That would have been just a, um, that would have been just horrifying for a lot of those um, academics. I think to hear about that. That would have been hegemonic and evil and and oppressive and all this stuff. So um, yes, um, if you dig deep enough, you'll find a political ideology and and a lot of that stuff. So here's uh, J. P. White's. Towards a compulsory curriculum. This is a one that I got for free from that professor's office. I had, I had read a lot of it from the library, and then it was a copy there for free from this office, so I took it. Um, I was interested in what are the arguments for having a compulsory curriculum, and that's why I was reading it. And he did make some good points, and now I'm trying to remember them. Um, there was one that I had in my head, but now I forget. Um, he was talking about, oh jeez, 
Well, I guess if you're really interested, you can just ask me, and I can look it up. I've got notes for the book, obviously. Um, I've got a giant Word document on my computer. Um, it's like 300 and something pages. 170,000 words or something. Um, all just annotations on books that I've read. I just wish I had a, a memory capacity of 170,000 characters. That would be nice. Um, but I'm just trying to remember what his one of his tenets was. Um, I don't, can't think of it now, but it, it was somewhat... It was interesting. Um, because I, I used to be on the line of, is it not better, is it not more efficient to have a curriculum that is driven by a child's own interests? Like, I was already on the line about in, curriculum should be individual. How can it be? If it's a, if it's just a general curriculum, it's never going to be, it's going to be, um, I don't, it's not going to be perfect, but it's not going to be, um, it's not going to, it's not going to be flexible for the individual students that come through. How can you possibly generate a curriculum for all grade five students? This is what that all grade five students will, will need to learn in math, but how can you possibly do that when you've got new kids coming in every year? How can you possibly use that? Um, you got to have more flexibility in the curriculum. And I thought, well, really the ideal is having an individualized curriculum. Maybe this kid is at a grade 8 level math. Teaching grade 8 level math. Don't waste his time with grade 5 level math. This actually happened to me when I was a kid in, in public school. They gave me stuff from the upper grades because I was bored in class and disruptive because I was bored in class. So they gave me upper year stuff and then I, I was busy. Um, why do that to a kid? And c consider it the opposite way. A kid is below in literacy. Um, don't give him stuff of the year because he'll just fail. Give him the stuff he needs so uh, he or she needs so that they can they can perhaps catch up or at least they can maintain two grade two uh, grade levels below. At least they maintain it rather than coming out of high school illiterate, which happens is and it's terrible. Um, so what was I talking about now? Now I don't know. Why was I going down that path? Oh, I was talking about what I used to what I used to agree with. So, but then okay, but then um, I got more into thinking about liberal education, and I thought, okay, um, as adults, we we know hopefully something, and children know nothing, and. I, at least we can help them along with this education rather than having the children and thus the culture reinventing the wheel every time we can help them along we have something to get, we have something to, to contribute as adults to the next generation and so it's best that we do that it, it's it's most productive that we do that and so I was thinking okay it's, so if there's going to be a liberal ed at all liberal ed compulsory part I don't it that's another kind of thing to talk about, but because I think it'd be better if education was was freely choose uh, chosen. Um, but for their, but I don't have any problems with with schools um, setting their own policies on curriculum. Um, you want to, you are a parent and you have a child, and you want that child to go to an arts based um, school or a science based school, whatever. That's fine. I think that's that's perfectly fine, and that, and uh, they can do that. Or you want like an individual school or, or whatever. Um, that's perfectly fine. Um, as I said in another video, I don't take the assumption that education needs to be publicly run. Um, I don't take that as that line. I do take the assumption that education should have the best outcome for kids and prepare them for living in this time and being educated and, and not and being uh, having a free mind so to speak um, that can make decisions and, and all that so and that need not require a public education system that might be a, that may be a conclusion that comes later but it's not an assumption that I take so uh, what else to say about that um, so, like, it's a, you can take the line of, well, free market and ed, so schools will just have their own curriculums, and the best one will win, because parents will choose that. Um, but if you want to take the public system line, which has a 
set curriculum, a state curriculum or a provincial curriculum, then you can criticize that in, um, by saying that, well, now you've got kids that are running through that have different needs and the curriculum is not going to meet their needs because the curriculum by definition is for everyone and it's not going to meet everyone's needs because it's not for them. It's for some mystical, ideal grade 5 kid that hopefully is coming through. Um, so it's got to be more flexible or it's not going to meet their needs. And it's Or you could take the Sawa line. You could say, well, there's a trade-off. Um, you could say... Um, Individual curriculum would be the would be a great idea, but it was just too expensive to run publicly. So we just have to think about this, what this uh, ideal grade five kid will look will be like and look like, and that'll be what we educate. We'll just do that. And yes, some kids are gonna not are gonna fall behind. Yes, some kids are gonna be bored to death. Um, but it's the most efficient and cost based system, and we kind of need that in a, in a public uh, sector uh, school. You could take that line too. You could take the trade-off line and say, "Well, we just do the best we can, and uh, we can't have a perfect world." You can do something like that as well. So there's lots to say, lots to say about that, and I don't want to, I don't want to rail about that too much longer. So here's uh, another Robin Barrow, Robin Barrow, the Canadian curriculum: a personal view. This was also on a discord discard, so I picked that up just to see uh, what that might be about. Okay, that's it for random stuff. Now this is um, some stuff about disability. So here is a textbook I used because I, I took a course in disability in my master's. So here is Children with Exceptionalities in the Canadian Classroom. This was the, the text we had to use. There it is right there. So it's got all kinds of recent research on autism and and um, ADHD and and yes, I'm aware of a lot of the uh, a lot of the stuff that says that ADHD is a myth and and I I actually think it's interesting um, because you wonder whether it's interesting I suppose because I had a personal encounter with that because I was almost put on Ritalin to because I was hyperactive when I was a child um, and. I don't know what would have happened to me if that's if I was put on Ritalin, because that would have been like grade two. Put on Ritalin until when? All the way up through elementary school, I assume. And I don't know what would have happened to me. And I that's a little bit unnerving to think about. But so ADHD is it a is it a um, outcome? of boring schools with, with kids that are full of energy and want to do something and want to run around. Um, what was ADHD like? If ADHD is truly a, a psychological disorder, um, what was ADHD like before it was discovered by um, psychologists? What was ADHD like for a kid in the medieval era? What was ADHD like for a kid in the 18th century, etc.? Um, was it a problem for them then? Why is it a problem for us now? Those kind of questions are important. Um, the DSM is the Bible for psychological disorders, and it's used to diagnose psychological disorders. There are fundamental issues with with it based on its philosophy, based on what it conceives as normal, because they have to to to. To grant something as a disorder, you have to compare it to something. It's a disorder compared to what? Compared to normal functioning is what they say. What is normal functioning? It, so, it's you got to be careful because I even think there's probably ideology in a lot of that stuff. And I often, it's a little bit conspiratorial, but I often wonder whether the school system and the psychologists are a little bit in bed together in terms of keeping and maintaining order in the classroom and by doing that um, finding ways of treating <laughs> treating the uh, those that are that uh, don't function in the environment they've created this sterile and boring classroom and I just wonder because consider that in many districts, if your kid has been diagnosed with something, and they are required to take the medication or they cannot come to school. 
and in some cases the, the child the, the drug is taken at school in order that, for the school to know that the child isn't has taken the drug <laughs> so that stuff like that to me it's I just think it's it just I think it's horrifying but anyways I'll c carry on here here's scattered minds by Mate I read this during my master it's actually very interesting um, this is on ADHD yeah he, um, he is a psychologist he actually has ADHD um, or diagnosed with it I guess and I wish I remembered more whoops I remember more about it I don't know if I have notes I think I do have notes on it so if anyone really wants to know I suppose I can I can talk about it more in another video but I remember that it was a it was an interesting read and it wasn't necessarily pro or against the whole ADHD stuff and he just took like a a humble view of you just have to deal with it and um, yeah so and then here's neurodiversity by Armstrong this is definitely a um, this is definitely like um, well here I'll read you the subtitle discovering the extraordinary gifts of autism ADHD dyslexia and other brain differences brain differences right that's the line so this that book is about there are no disorders disorders are are created by society so it, it's the whole argument about people who can't walk are not disabled um, it's just that society makes them disabled because there's not enough curbs that are cut so they can use their wheelchairs and there's not enough accessible stores and and so it's society creates the disabilities that's all insane and ridiculous um, it, it's about survival physical disability does not allow you to survive it is it it would be very difficult to survive in a jungle like environment if you're physically disabled although of course we don't live in those times anymore but I think that's the point it's why it's labeled disability it's not something you'd want it's not something you grant your children then it's likely a disability um, now what was I going with that so um, he talks about autism as obviously there are there are uh, they're called savants there are people who have autism that are extraordinarily gifted in mathematics for example like the whole um, I want to say uh, it's a beautiful mind I think that was that is what it was or even the rain man stuff rain man I think that's a better example rain man um, there's gifts but obviously a lot of social dysfunction and, and dependency is 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 there um, and so they they want to celebrate that and that's a good thing there's nothing wrong with that um, but we have to keep in perspective that that these are not these are disabilities that require our help and we have to make that um, we have to assert that we have to it has to um, be be known and not um, and not forgotten or not kind of put under the rug and and just we have to consider that that these are are issues in functioning in independent functioning and um, but anyways it's just um, it it makes the argument similar to those about the blind that we can use Braille and and the blind can get around um, it says that we can have the same kind of um, turn in events or turn in our in our uh, I want to say prejudice but that's kind of harsh we can have that same turn for also people with neurological issues like autism for example so anyways it it puts a lot of the disabilities in a positive light showing the advantages and there's that's fine but we can't forget the disadvantages we have to remember those things um, okay you know here's a few more random books so I've got on the bottom here a child development textbook by Rutherford and here's one I it was a discard brand new I don't know why someone discarded forward by Steven Pinker um, why our children can't read and what we can do about it a scientific revolution in reading by Diane McGinnis uh, forward by Pinker so 
You see that? So that, I thought, well, oh, okay, I'll have that. That was a discard. Brand new. I don't really know why it's a discard. Uh, it looks brand new. So, that'll be interesting. That's important. Literacy is very important. You know, back to the, just briefly, the whole compulsory cur curriculum thing. Literacy, I nearly, if I didn't have more libertarian political leanings, literacy would be a compulsory <laughs> curriculum. Without literacy in the 21st century, there's non, there's no functioning. Um, there's none. You have to be able to read, or you are, you are an outsider. Um, you, I can't, I can't imagine you would be an amusing ourselves to death, Neil Postman, if you couldn't read. You would be sitting on the couch watching TV. That's no good. You have to be able to read. You, if you cannot read, you cannot do any independent study. You can't be thinking other than what's on the news. That's not good. I think literacy is a component of independence. We need more of that. Here's The Scent of the Child. This is actually a really good book I, I read a while ago. And I've, I've, I had been meaning to get a copy of it. Because it was just very well read. And it's about um, human evolution. And um, The Scent of the Child. I have notes on it if you want more. But... Um, I found it at a used bookstore for a couple bucks, and so I picked it up because I it was a really good book, a really good read, and it's nice to have a, have a copy of that kind of stuff. It's by Elaine Morgan. So, yeah. Here's another discard. Really old book. Play and Development. Just a black cover, but reason why I uh, the reason why I picked it up is because it's got in here Piaget um, and Eric Erickson this is 1972 so oh yeah I have that it's got those guys in there alrighty this is another good one on child development by Alison Gop Gopnik the scientist in the crib very very good very interesting about how children um, understand the world, how they, where this inquiry comes from, this inquiry that the babies have, they they walk, they crawl and are looking at stuff and put stuff in their mouth and and touching stuff and and uh, throwing stuff and dropping stuff. You ever seen like the kids, kid in a in a high chair, you know, eating something, and they'll drop their spoon and at the side of the chair and watch it hit the floor, and the, she just. She creates this, she takes all, all kinds of research, tons and tons of research. And she, it's not written for, it's not, a, um, it's not like an academic book though, it's written for anyone. She, she gets all kinds of research together and she shows that children act like scientists. So it's very good. That's a very good book for anyone. I uh, should read that one. Here's another one by Keegan. I got this from the professor who was retiring. Education and Psychology, Plato, Piaget, and Scientific Psychology. I don't know what that's about, but um, that's Kieran Egan. Got quite a few of his stuff now. And the last one, The Child in Crisis. This is just a plain old hardcover. Um... It's just got a bunch of um, different little topics in here that I thought might be interesting. It's by Doyle and, and Barons. And it's got here um, Wanting to Die, Failing in School, Mystery Illness, Sexual Abuse, Child of Divorce, Abusing Drugs. It just kind of got random stuff and I guess how children deal with it. There may be an ideological line in that, but I don't really know. But anyways, okay. Um, one more shelf of education books, which are teaching and and uh, Dewey, and a few more random stuff.